Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, the old-time butcher shop may not be as popular as it once was, but thanks to some folks, it hasn't disappeared completely. We'll show you how some business owners are making sure their shop stays a cut above. Baby, it's cold outside. For these plants, the winter temperatures are no sweat. See if they'll work for your garden. And here's something to put under the tree, a jar full of treats and healthy goodies. We'll give you the tips to make one yourself. For one couple, when farm life came calling, they answered. See how they traded in big city living for a pig pen and some wide open spaces. Farm Week starts right now. I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Troy Mullick. Thanks for joining us today here on Farm Week. Leighton, I'm in the Christmas spirit. How about I, you? I sure am. Love these decorations. Love this time of year. And best wishes to all of you, our dedicated viewers. Too. Yes, most definitely. We, we appreciate the viewers spending some of their uh, Christmas holiday with us. Our first story is going to be an extended look at a special man we introduced you to several months ago. Paul Good has spent 90 years on this earth and more than 70 of those years he's been farming. Earlier this year he was nominated for the 2016 Sunbelt Expo Southeastern Farmer of the Year Award and as you'll see from this piece it couldn't have happened to a better farmer and a better man. When you've been farming for 70 years you can expect your fair share of admirers. And for Paul Good, people flock to him like caterpillars to a cornfield. He lives and breeds farming and he loves family and friends. And he loves to share his information with the community. Just an outstanding individual. That's Dennis Reginelli. And he's known Paul Good for 25 years. This past fall, he even nominated him for the 2016 Sunbelt Expo Southeastern Farmer of the Year Award. A farmer from Arkansas won, but that didn't damper Dennis's thoughts on his friend. If you look at Mr. Good, you look at the little things that he's doing that make big impact on his farm. And when you start looking at uh, what his impact has made, not only to the county, but to the state, and we in Extension take a lot of those things that he has uh, initiated, and we take them to the other growers in the county. Paul has spent 42 of his 90 years on this earth farming in Mississippi. He started off as a cotton kingpin, but more recently, he's farmed soybeans, corn, catfish, and wheat across 1,000 acres. We continually keep thinking every day, and we take evaluation every year, what can we do to make our farming practice more successful, and how are some of the practices that we might have to change to fit the crops that we are raising. For Mississippi State Extension, almost three quarters of a century of experience has proven to be invaluable. When we do projects with Mr. Good uh, and the results are shared, uh, you know that it's uh, that it come from an outstanding farm with uh, you know, all the practices done correctly. So not only can uh, we share information with him, uh, he's sharing his resources and land with us so we can get valuable data so we can share around the state. It's a partnership that began when Paul moved down south from Indiana over four decades ago. Through this all, when I began to ask for information, they volunteered to help me in any way that they could. And by working with Mississippi Extension and also USDA uh, with uh, various tests and various projects, why it became very helpful to me, and I'm sure without it, it would have been very difficult. He's been able to thrive in an unpredictable field by learning new technology and keeping a diverse marketing portfolio <laughs> that has included selling seed and exporting goods down the mighty Mississippi. He's an expert in marketing, 
Uh, he studies uh, material all day long, even on weekends, he's looking at those things that's going to make him a better operator. I just like uh, being around him because uh, I've learned so much. He's made me a better person because of who he is. He's also served on various farming and conservation boards and hosted visitors from Europe, Asia, and South America. The whole time, his faith and family has been at the forefront. My wife that uh, today is, uh, was a coal miner's daughter, and she's very energetic and very much uh, help in there. We feel as we're equal partners in our farming operation, and uh, she's helped us naturally with bookkeeping, with running for parts, for basically uh, about every phase of it. So I guess you could say that life is all good for Paul Good, a good farmer and a good man. Reporting in Brooksville, Mississippi, I'm Troy Mullen. Well, are you looking for an outdoor container that is tough enough to stand up to winter's cold temperatures? Well, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Gary Bachman shows us some plants that can give us some color and handle the cold, but they can also form unique combinations. Sometimes those gardeners who like to grow in containers don't think they have many options in the winter. Today I'd like to share a few ideas for cool season combo containers. There are actually quite a few cool season plants to use. Some of my favorites include colorful matrix pansies and sorbet viola, the colors and textures of ornamental kale, cabbage, and even mustard, and the bright spikes of sonnet snapdragons but many gardeners don't think to put them together in the same container. Let's take a look at a few combo examples. Anchoring this cool season combo are the serrated white peacock kale, fringed red Nagoya flatleaf kale, and purple color-up cabbage. Adding color are matrix pansies and one of my favorite container foliage plants, bloody sorrel, with its sanguine veins. Now this cool season combo has a purplish red theme. The large frilly leaves of red seaboard kale have reddish veins and the tight leafy head of glamour red kale is tinted purple. Matrix raspberry sundae mix pansies add to the color theme. Our next combo container has the serrated green leaves of kale and pretty colors of sonnet snapdragons. I love the color pop of Matrix Blotch Mix Pansies. This combination container also features the rather fierce looking red tinged leaves of Red Dragon Mustard. So visit your local garden center and pick up some plants for your own cool season combo. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Hopefully you've got all your Christmas shopping done, but if you're at a loss for gifts to give friends and coworkers, we'll help you out. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, MSU Extension's Natasha Haynes gives you a healthy and creative gift idea that won't break the bank. Do you know how much pressure I feel trying to make holiday food gifts for everyone? I mean, it has to be perfect, a healthy treat, that's not expensive and doesn't take forever to make. <sighs> I need some Food Factor elves or something. Twas a night before Christmas, and the Food Factor star was dreaming of gifts she could make in a jar. Something healthy and pretty, but also good tasting, so her holiday treats would not go to wasting. Her elves sought ideas on Extension's Pinterest board and found recipes for soup mixes and gifts all would adore. On spices, on lentils, on bay leaves and peas, on lids, rings and labels, on ribbons, yes please. And she heard them exclaim as they panned out of sight, Merry Christmas to all. And to all a good bite. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. 
It's now time for today's trivia quiz. And since it's the Christmas season, today's question is about Christmas trees. We want to know, according to the National Christmas Tree Association, about how many acres in the United States are used for Christmas tree production? Is the answer 250,000, 350,000, is it 450,000, or is it 550,000? Make your guess and we'll have the answer coming up. We're going to pause for a short break, but don't go anywhere. Layton will have a story about a couple butcher shops that are serving their customers the old fashioned way. Plus, it takes a little luck and a little skill to accomplish your dream. We'll meet a couple who left the big city behind them to become hog farmers. See why even they are surprised at where they are now. Stay with us. They say this is the information age where people can instantly find any answers they're looking for. Yet so many of us still can't figure out how to feel better. Well, here's a suggestion, eat better. And what better place than a Mississippi farmer's market to help you do just that. Locally grown fruits and vegetables are healthy, picked at the peak of quality and freshness to help you feel better. We at Mississippi State Extension want you to know how grateful we are for your support through all these years. So we're wishing you a Merry Christmas and a happy holiday season. I want to take this opportunity to wish all of the Farm Week viewers a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Merry Christmas from the State 4-H staff. Merry Christmas, everyone, and remember to put your hay on the roof for Rudolph. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year! From the College of Forest Resources and the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, Forest and Wildlife Research Center, Mississippi Agriculture Forestry Experiment Station. I hope Santa brings you some great gifts this year. Merry Christmas! This holiday season. Make healthy food a factor in your life. Merry Christmas from Ag Communications. Happy Holidays. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. From all of us here on the Farm Week crew. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas. Happy, happy holidays, holidays and, and Happy New, New Year. Year. There was a time when a trip to the local meat locker was part of a weekly routine. The butcher often knew every customer by name and could offer help with a selection or two. The implementation of centralized meat cutting reduced the necessity for multiple stops on marketing day. However, you're about to see the local locker has never been completely cut out of the picture. For decades, small butcher shops and meat lockers were a staple of American life. These mom and pop establishments began disappearing, however, as more families began to buy their meat at one-stop grocery stores. We've seen a fair amount of them disappear. Uh, they're older facilities, and when the current owners retire or move on through lack of interest in doing the work and are the building being old and maybe not up to date with its, you know, its, its equipment and standards that the government like to see in a building, they close down. But that downward trend may be slowing or even reversing. Fairway Stores opened a brand new, old concept meat shop. The store, considerably smaller than its typical grocery, aims to capitalize on both the company's reputation for quality meat and nostalgia for old butcher shops. I hope that the customer comes in this Fairway Meat Market and has an experience of once again, the old style meat markets from back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, the way old fairways were from the standpoint of uh, when they would see their butcher at the meat block, etc. But uh, we've taken that, we've kept that feeling, and we've modernized it. Fairway Meat Market, the company's first, has a meat counter that is 16 feet longer than those in its typical store. It also features fresh seafood and grass-fed beef. And while larger metro areas such as New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles have new shops where the meat cutters like to call themselves artisanal butchers, there are others scattered throughout the nation where that kind of work never went out of style, even if those butchers don't apply trendy lingo to what they do. I'm like, hey Mike, you can edit all this, right? Yeah. 
What's that, artisan butcher? Although Chris Kramer would never consider labeling himself this way, he is about as much an artisan, a marketing term that hints at a craftsman cutting by hand as a butcher can get. Kramer is a fourth-generation butcher who has run his own shop in Elmwood, Nebraska since 1981. His great-grandfather was a butcher in Denmark. His grandfather, who owned a horse slaughter plant in Papillion, Nebraska, told stories of how some ate horse meat, normally used in dog food, during the lean years of World War II. Kramer's late father ran several butcher shops in his lifetime in both Nebraska and Kansas. In the late 1920s, the first meat lockers were opened in the U.S., and farmers or others rented frozen food storage to preserve the meat they had butchered. From, from the early days, settlers, so to speak, they did their butchering, obviously, on the farm. Uh, they had cellars. They would uh, cut ice from ponds and take it into their cellar, cover it with hay, and they would have, if I recall, they could have cold meat until July if, under the right conditions and they had enough ice. And then if it moves on from there, it got to where, you know, electricity and you, and you had your small locker plant like this start up. By 1940, almost half of U.S. homes had a refrigerator. Eventually, demand for the lockers fell off. Many of these surviving shops diversified by adding butchering services. According to census data, a large decline occurred between 1992 and 2012, when 45% of remaining U.S. meat shops closed their doors. More than 300 miles to the northeast in southern Minnesota is another meat locker that survived the decades when so many others shuttered. The 81-year-old Conger meat market was opened in 1935 by a Czechoslovakian immigrant and butcher named Ray Butch Bohanik. An area farmer had convinced Bohanik to leave the Lake Mills, Iowa butcher shop where he was working to open his own in Conger, Minnesota. Milford Bohanik, who ran the operation with his wife Beverly from 1959 to 2000, says his father built the shop on skids, thinking he could have the building dragged to a new location if Conger let him down. There wasn't a basement put in there until Oh, I don't know the number of years afterwards, and they lifted the building up and, and put a basement underneath it, yeah. The Bohanic family ran Conger Meat Market for 70 years before selling it 11 years ago to current owners Jeremy and Darcy Johnson. What we originally talked about was to leave everything the same. We didn't want to change anything. We didn't want to change the recipes, the tried and true traditions of the Conger Meat Market. They worked for 80 years, so that's not something we we're going to change. The couple has tried to keep the big things, like Butch Bohanik's traditional recipes from Czechoslovakia, and little things, like handing out samples from the meat smoker to kids while making plans for future expansion. We thought, it's a great opportunity um, to buy an established business and to be self-employed. Currently, the meat sold in their small retail shop comes from larger federally inspected meat packing plants that are scattered throughout the nation. They, like many smaller state inspected meat lockers, are limited to connecting livestock producers with buyers looking for a custom cut quarter or half of beef, pork, or venison. They also are restricted to in-state sales. Our job, in a sense, is easy because we are surrounded by so many successful farmers and the quality of the meat that's coming in is just second to none. And I think uh, people, the customers, are happy when they come through our door because they know they're going to fill their freezer with um, locally raised, good quality beef or pork. Next year, Darcy and Jeremy Johnson hope to open a small, federally inspected meat packing plant in an old creamery next door. Because they will be federally inspected, they will be able to sell locally raised meat in smaller amounts directly to customers. The designation further allows for sales across state lines. So far, the creamery they are renovating for the Conger Meat Market expansion does not appear to feature any skids. I think uh, the Conger Meat Market will be here for another 80 years. Well, back to the trivia quiz now as we wrap things up for this portion of Farm Week. Our quiz question again, how many acres in the United States are used for Christmas tree production? 
Well, the answer is B. There are about 350,000 acres in production for growing Christmas trees, much of that preserving green space. Sometimes the constraints of living the urban life require city dwellers to cash in their subdivision for wide open space. Few, if any, are able to successfully make the transition to the great outdoors. However, as Farm Week's Amy Myers tells us, one family's step toward country living is paying some unexpected dividends. In the spring of 2013, Jason and Angela Johnson launched Lucky George Farm. It had been their dream to live on a small farm, raising and growing their own food, and at the same time, being good stewards of the land. Without realizing it, the couple stumbled upon a successful strategy to produce pork with a purpose instead of pork with a profit. What grew from their hard work has gone far beyond their wildest dreams. It fit the way that we wanted to farm, which was hands off not intensive farming, hands off an extensive model, a traditional model rather than a conventional model. On 20 acres, the Johnsons carved out a multi-species plan to pasture heritage breed chickens, geese, sheep, goats, cows, and pigs. I thought, what if we could find a system that honored the animal and allowed them to grow to uh, an older age, be raised outside, and um, in an environment that you could put many animals in. It produces a product that's different than what you would find elsewhere. To help offset input costs, the family began selling various cuts at farmers markets nearby. Word spread about their product line and an urban audience started to take notice. More products that you can offer, you can bring to the customer, you know, drives an interest. So there's, a, there's certain producers that maybe only have beef or maybe only in pork, but if somebody walks up to our booth, they're like, oh, you have quail eggs, you have chicken eggs, you have, uh, you have mutton, which is an adult sheep. That's something that nobody that sells. We have goat meat and we have large black pigs. So, you know, it's, there's an interest there that just doesn't exist um, among other producers. They've been searching for a pork that would be healthy enough to meet their dietary demands and be hardy enough to thrive in an outside environment at Lucky George Farm. All the characteristics the Johnsons were looking for were found in the large black heritage breed. We bought the farm for us. We did not buy the farm to be a business. And it was totally a shock and surprise the first six months when we found out other people wanted our meat. Some of those other people showing interest in Lucky George products are part of a movement known as Kushan 555, a group that promotes heritage breed pork and those who produce it. Through culinary competitions staged across the country, organizers pair up top chefs with small family farms in an effort to raise awareness of these unique breeds. And when you find it, it's small family farmers who are raising it. You can't exist on an industrial level. So it's almost every time that you buy Heritage Report, chew on it, you're just supporting family farming. It's a direct hit. Organizers at the Minneapolis semi-final Koshan 555 event began looking to pair up the Johnson family with a top chef who wanted to work with the large black breed. Jorge Guzman, executive chef for Surly Brewing Company in Minneapolis, Minnesota, answered the call. Guzman believes in supporting heritage breed production to educate consumers on the differences in taste and character found in old world breeds. So knowing that we have a responsibility, that's how we source our food. And hopefully it just it's a trickle down effect, like this is the way that most restaurants should purchase. On any given Saturday, Surly Brewing Company restaurants will see 2,000 customers far too many for small operations like Lucky George Farm to provide a large enough supply. But for special occasions, Guzman and his team purchase and prepare a plethora of plates using exclusively heritage breed pork. Well, that's your, your pork chop and your loin and your belly. And so what we have for you is... With a win at Koshan 555 in Minneapolis, Guzman, his team, and Lucky George Farm earned a seat at the big table in Snowmass, Colorado for the Grand Koshan. Ten teams from across the country went head-to-head -head in hopes of being recognized as having the best-tasting pork in the country. It is amazing to see, you know, a farm like Lucky George jump into the game 
do something they believe in, be very passionate about it, and that product showcases what the stewards of those animals are doing, and it comes through in that animal. It comes through on a plate for a chef. These pigs have a life, and they're going to one day be on your plate. They have a life with purpose, and hopefully we're raising them in a purposeful way. Well, they certainly had a dream, and they accomplished it. They sure did. Sounds like they're getting pretty successful at it, too, uh, don't For they? sure, yeah. 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 All right, well, that's going to do it for this week's show, but make sure you tune in next week. Last show of 2016, it's going to be a good one. Nostalgia is still alive and well on one piece of land. We'll meet a farmer who's doing it the old-fashioned way in order to help a younger generation appreciate the past. And from chicken noodle to lobster bisque, the possibilities are endless when it comes to soup. We'll tell you about the healthy benefits of this cold weather treat. And with the downturn in milk prices, we'll look to see how some farmers are diversifying their portfolio. What they're choosing to produce may surprise you. All right, well, for the whole Farm Week crew, I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm Leighton Spann. Once again, Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. We will see you next week.